What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 266 at block height 680,594 on Sunday, April 25th. What's up, guys? Hello, mascot. It's the highest block height yet. (laughs) I am the best mascot ever. I am a living embodiment of a meme. And I'm an AI. And I'm unprepared. Sounds like it'll be a blast today. As usual. So, um, yeah, th- this first one. This no one is gets a... to hear the long, awkward silences. <laughs> <laughs> I reserve them for me today. Th- this first story, though, is a story for the ages. This is is the start of a new eon. Bitcoin has officially passed the point of no return and become something greater than it was before because blockchain info has fucking finally merged SegWit support after four fucking years. After they claimed they were ready to roll it out before SegWit was even activated. After an official blog post stating their intent to roll it out in 2018. After completely ignoring all users and community members' questions about when the hell SegWit is going to come through all of 2018, all of 2019, all of 2020, all of 2021. They have finally flipped the switch and turned something on. That saves their own fucking customers money. It's amazing. This is the start of a new age, people. Four Just years of blockchain dot disinfo. To be behind again. Yep. Now we can start the meme when taproot. Uh, oh god, I call, twenty years. I call twenty twenty four. Oh, you're way more optimistic than me. But like, yeah, I mean, th- this is just really amazing to me that it took this long. Even with the arguments, they they support ETH and Bcash and other shit coins now. Um, all of the code necessary for this is in libraries everywhere. Like, how high is it? <laughs> just pull some of that in and turn it on so your own flipping customers pay less money yeah can you i mean look like (laughs) they were complaining about fees and how we have to make bigger blocks to get lower fees for a long time then you get segwit and everyone then learns segwit you can get lower fees and you do get lower fees with people been getting lower fees for a long time and it took them this long to do that so can you imagine how long it's going to take for them to taproot when It doesn't solve something that they are very prominently complaining about every day. Yep. Like, I don't know. I don't get the impression that they give a shit about privacy. So uh, what about that? Or smart contracts. They can just say, use ETH. Yeah, I I feel like I have to bring up a private conversation that I had with um, somebody a couple years ago. And I I do want to state this is a while ago, so take this with a grain of salt. But um, somebody who was familiar with blockchain's back end pretty much told me that they were stuck on like 0.11 of core because all of their 
stack built on top of it was just hard coded with API RPC assumptions that changed after that. And so they had, they were just in this situation where everything is baked into how an old node works and they were stuck with that. And I seriously wonder how much of actually getting to this point of deploying SegWit maybe had absolutely nothing to do with the complexity of implementing SegWit. It, it was all about just having to <laughs> completely redo their whole stack to not be dependent on that out of date node and actually enforce those rules for their customers. And I, I, I just really wonder if that might not be the the real issue behind this and not just we can't figure out segwit hopefully they fixed other problems along the way or made new ones i'd bet on made new ones happens even to the best of us but it happens more to the worst which is why they're wise and do nothing <laughs> so yeah i think i think i got all my laughs in um you want to take us into the next one, Fud? Oh, yeah. Good old Vinmo. PayPal's estranged cousin, or not so, or what have you, has decided to launch crypto in parallel with PayPal. Uh, Vinmo has more than 70 million customers. Uh, they will allow you to buy as little as $1 of crypto. Um, According to a 2020 Venmo customer behavior study, more than 30% of Venmo customers have already started purchasing crypto or equities, 20% of which started during the pandemic. I think it's really interesting that they decided to put crypto or equities. So, you know, uh, the top 50% of Americans by income, many of them hold stocks, the lower 50%, not very many of them. So I don't know what the or equities part is in there like if they're giving us good age demographics there and we don't know it uh but it sounds like they are going to use the same channels that paypal has been using no surprise there uh which is the paxos trust company and paypal was also granted a conditional bit license which is evidently the first of its kind uh by the new york state department of financial services and that's what allows PayPal and Venmo to offer customers the ability to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency, but of course not transfer it out of their pristine database. Yep. When you got a database this good, why would you want your crypto to go anywhere else? I think that this this launch ties a lot into the walled garden and no no uses money stuff that we got into with that show with nick the other day like i i really really find it hard to believe that if paypal and venmo when they get around to flipping on you can spend it i highly doubt they're going to do anything except just report every transaction you make to the irs to make sure that you're a good boy with taxes and what do you think that's going to do to the incentives regarding spending it? People aren't going to want to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear what there is to report to the IRS if you don't have a cost basis, but I'm, I'm not good at taxes. Um, should mention, this means they are offering Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash. So sorry, no Doge kids. You'll have to speculate somewhere else. Let's see. In exchange news. Uh, Janine, this is uh, some more of that revolving door stuff going on. Yep. Uh, I mean, the short of it is it's not that exciting. Uh, in practice, uh, Binance.us apparently decided to hire uh, Brian Brooks as their new CEO. Um, if you don't remember, Brian Brooks, uh, well, he was the acting comptroller of currency at the SEC or OCC. And um, before that, he was a uh, legal, I can't remember, chief legal counsel at Coinbase. Yeah, I think so. 
Um, yeah, chief or chief legal officer, I think. And yeah, so uh, kind of odd. I did a thread last year on Twitter about some of his rather, uh, well, the questionable circumstances uh, of uh, him getting that role. Uh, there's a tweet. Uh, from obviously Brian Armstrong congratulating Brian because he used to work at Coinbase, which is quote tweeting a tweet from Brian Brooks thanking Steve Mnuchin for congratulating him for getting the role. Uh, if you don't know Steve Mnuchin, there's a, a series about him from Peter McCormick's podcast. Uh, Def- was it on Defiance? I think it was uh, about what a giant asshole he is and still continues to be. And, um, you know, Brian Brooks made this, uh, apparently, according to Bloomberg, he was not required to take an ethics pledge that would limit his ability to work in lobbying after he leaves the job. Um, But he still apparently made a letter anyway, saying that he would not get involved in conflicts of interest with Amazon, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, or Coinbase, and a bunch of other firms. Um... He's also worked with a guy named uh, Joseph Otting from Blackridge, uh, which is uh, yeah, lots of interesting history about that to do with um, you know, flirt foreclosure mills and all of that. And also, he made some comments last year about how he didn't like the idea of people being allowed to wear masks in banks because uh, security trumps uh, health and, you know, whatever you want to believe about the chances of, you know, average age people or young people getting COVID, uh, pretty acceptable uh, to believe at this point that at least very old people are susceptible to it to a large extent and old people tend to be the primary customers of physical bank branches. So telling people who are most at risk that they are not allowed to wear masks in a bank for security because somehow apparently a mask is, uh, I don't know, it like makes you do terrible things as soon as you walk into a bank. Um, Yeah, he's just saying, you know, I'm not a public health expert, but I think everyone agrees that we shouldn't be allowed to wear masks in banks. Okay, buddy. Um, Yeah, so great guy. And so now he's the CEO of Binance US, which I mean, I don't really care because I would never use Binance. I've never used Binance, but apparently that's the kind of thing that they want there. And uh, apparently it's revolving door day because on the same day, I believe it was the same day, April 20th. Yeah, I think it was April 20th. Yep. Uh, on the same day, it was also announced that uh, <laughs> uh, Chris Giancarlo, um, or I don't know if that's his, that's his middle name, but Giancarlo from the CFTC is also joining the board of directors at BlockFi our favorite lending platform <laughs> that has a uh, former, um, well, U.S. intelligence and Palantir person as their security guy. Good luck with that. Um, yeah, so it's just, you know, revolving door day. And I also, you know, briefly just thought, oh, what are the chances that he also has some revolving door uh, history in him beyond just, you know, going from the CFTC to a lending a crypto lending platform, it turns out that uh, actually between um, him serving for the U.S. government and this BlockFi appointment, he is is or was the chairman of the board for Common Securitization Solutions, LLC, a joint venture between Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Isn't that beautiful? Nice. Yeah. Well, it's definitely interesting to see the crypto community of companies come along and start vacuuming up uh, highly appointed U.S. you know finance officials. They are acting more and more like banks all the time. Uh, we've got FTX with 40 years worth of naming rights. Uh, it's fair to say these guys are paying to stick around. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of it. I'm I'm sure that it was purely a a skills based evaluation. No doubt. Really, what's 
interesting to me is Brooks going to the U.S. subsidiary of a foreign company in, instead of hunting around for positions at an American one. The American ones might have all the CEO roles filled. And Binance is the largest in the world, is it not, at this point? Yeah, but I think that's more the, the proper um, Asian entity. Um, I don't think those stats roll in like all the different subsidiaries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but still, as a brand, uh, they're doing pretty good. And there's no better place to not have conflicts of interest with Coinbase than running Binance. Yeah, it's just, eh. More American companies need to be playing these games. Are the Winklevi is one of them CEO of Gemini, or do they have somebody else in there as CEO? Actually, not sure. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, so, I've always been I've always been curious how that works. Like when when it comes to decide which one of them should run a business, like do they like flip a coin, or do they both become like joint fusion CEO or something? Yeah, it's just weird. You know, that's the other big name in the game here, and I couldn't name it, but the face of Gemini is the same face times two. I I, I don't think I've they... ever I don't think I've ever seen them separate. I always thought they just kind of handled it like in Dragon Ball Z. You just do the Super Saiyan dance and you fuse into one. One of them may well be a corporeal hologram. And yeah, that's why they support digital currency so much. Also, I'd love to know how they do KYC. <laughs> I wonder if they've ever tried to do each other's KYC. Yeah, it was I probably fun in college. Day. Trading dates. All right, though. The mysteries of the Winklevi twins aside, um, I think Wyoming just finalized something that had been hanging around for a while that looks really interesting. Yeah, this, this one's fun, and I hadn't heard about it ahead of time, but Caitlin Long put out a tweet thread on this. Uh, evidently, Wyoming the state that originated the LLC structure has decided that DAOs can be represented by an LLC in the state. Uh, so evidently there is a new classification of LLC that is going to go live in Wyoming that uh, represents a DAO or all participants of a DAO under a LLC blanket structure uh, so that if a DAO is ever deemed by a court to be a general partnership, uh, then it falls under this LLC structure and uh, has all the limited liability protections that an LLC gets. Um, evidently, it's a special kind. So if the Secretary of State decides that uh, the DAO has committed fraud or is engaged in illegal activities, he can pull the special, he or she can pull the special liability protection from them. And then, you know, it's all downhill from there. Uh, but this is just one more case where Wyoming, uh, with its, what, five or 600,000 people, is trying to drum them up some more business to the state. Yeah, this, I think, is huge, because I'm sure half the people who hear the word DAO are thinking some idiotic smart contract thing on Ethereum, but like, no, it's just an organization where you have keys signing off on things that are the governing entities, legally speaking. And given the fact that Wyoming already allows so many like privacy preserving ways of handling LLC membership and owners and registering such things, like this really opens a new door in terms of streamlining, like running a business, um, as well as another additional potential privacy shield there. Like, I mean, imagine how simplified running some small lean business could be when like you can just protocolize all decision makings meetings shit like that and just have that audit log of keys signing everything 
like you could even do like things that normally like people have to be here now same time talk shit out like you could maybe do that completely asynchronously it's fun that these guys are are waiting in to the laws here um just if nothing else because it enables companies to have some sort of idea of the legal footing they'll be on when they're in relatively unexplored spaces uh and props to wyoming for doing it ahead of everybody else Mm -hmm. so are we ready for some fun ideas popping around um the bisc development community yes so wiz posted yesterday um a couple tweets and it looks like bisc is going to start work on implementing liquid as a base layer trade option um on the bisc platform um and yeah this opens a lot of potential interesting doors i mean first things first um like this needs to be presented to users in a way where they understand what kind of trust trade-off they're making accepting bitcoin on on liquid instead of the main chain but you know wiz wants to kind of offer that option and really see what can be built out on top of this and as well in addition to that um a main chain transaction or or trade um forgive me on bisc takes four on-chain transactions so at the same time as working on liquid support they want to work on optimizing that down to a single transaction on chain and they also do have um a uh, discussion open on github for general ideas on optimizing the main chain trade protocol there but you know this could open a whole new door of potential in terms of non-kyc peer-to-peer bitcoin trading just because doing this on the main chain it, it will get more and more cost prohibitive and price out people trying to get smaller and smaller amounts of bitcoin that that's just a fact and trying to integrate you know bisc trade protocols into something like lightning that's going to be very complicated and take a lot of work but if you offer something like liquid as an option all of the complexity to do that gets boiled down to just a base layer blockchain and the ability to upgrade to have more flexible features the main chain doesn't that offers a lot of potential security model improvements assuming you're okay with the federation as a base trust model and also it just is an option to get away from that problem of people being priced out of direct trading like that and especially if we continue seeing you know products and marketplaces built where people can swap in and out of liquid without having to interact directly with the federation like that could open a whole new door to keeping those types of peer-to-peer marketplaces for on and off ramps something viable for people so that that doesn't just turn into something where plebs are priced out if you can't pay massive on-chain fees if you aren't trying to buy a large enough amount of bitcoin at once so i am really interested to see where this goes like this could wind up being one of the first real drivers of use of liquid picking up if this is done right yeah that's the other nice thing about them going there is it's going to be a snowball effect uh the more people who start there in this case bisc which is what maybe the the most well known uh non kyc or peer to peer way to buy bitcoin uh just that going to liquid is going to pull other services and general interest to liquid yep and you know once like once that ability to atomically cross chains really starts maturing i mean like that is the type of flexibility you want like maybe you know 
you can't afford to go buy a thousand dollars of Bitcoin on chain because fees are like two hundred dollars, but you can do it on liquid. And if this whole ecosystem matures enough, okay, you don't want to be on liquid anymore. You can debate the costs of opening your own channel uh, on the main chain and just swapping that out. Or you could, you know, if things play out the way I hope they will to some degree, maybe someone in your friend group or your family has a little custodial micro bank on Lightning they'll let you use. And you can pull out of the liquid federation and trust them instead. Like it, it just, it, it stops the on and off ramps from being strangled into the coin bases and the Krakens and the cash apps. It's evolving. Ha 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 ha. Speaking of cool evolutions and shit though. So I think if I'm correct, my memory is not failing me. Um, Back in January, Janine covered a white paper on um, adapter signature based atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero. Mm -hmm. On April 22nd, um, Commit Network and Samurai Wallet successfully tested on um, Testnet and the equivalent um, network on Monero. An atomic swap coordinated by Samurai between Monero and Bitcoin. And they have a very minimal um, viable product of the automated swap backend to accomplish this, which is pretty much its own daemon um, that also has a client, um, a CLL client for kind of the, the taker in this model to interact with the automated backend. And it's a pretty flexible system that can either hook up to centralized um, backends for Bitcoin and Monero balances, um, pull a price um, from a price oracle, and also be slapped on your own um, Monero or Bitcoin and Electrum server instances. And Pretty much um, the daemon will just automatically handle um, interacting with an external Monero wallet and setting up its own wallet. Um, and it runs its own Bitcoin wallet internal to the actual daemon. And um, pretty much from that point, it's, uh, it's just a simple uh, server client protocol where a client can approach um, anyone running these servers propose an atomic swap. And if you have the balance available to do it, the server will just handle um, all the swapping logic automatically in the background. It'll do the swap. If something goes wrong, it will automatically handle um, the refund. And if anybody acts malicious to a point in the structure, there's also the second time lock that allows the, um, the taker client to be penalized. And um, yeah, so my hunch is that probably before the end of the year, um, we're going to see this implemented as a, a mainline supported feature in Samurai, um, if my hunch is correct. Yeah, and I haven't looked at this, but I'm assuming that they're, for the Bitcoin side, they're still using ECDSA, right? Because uh, originally, uh, when I mentioned this back in January, they were talking about um, that they were going to actually focus the final design around Schnorr, Schnorr signatures instead, because uh, according to them, a little birdie said that you know Schnorr would be implemented soon, so that then they wouldn't waste time building it out for ECDSA when they could do it for Schnorr instead. So, but I'm assuming for this test, they were doing ECDSA still. Um, I'm actually not sure. I only went through the docs and didn't really have a chance to go through any of the code, but it could be um, Schnorr based. I'm not sure. I haven't really been paying attention to what is or is not turned on on testnet. Well, I know that because like it depends which one because like Signet now I think does Schnorr, but I don't know if the main testnet does that yet. You know, odds are probably ECDSA, but I'm not 100% sure. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah. 
interesting feature in general and it was cool to see that paper published and it's nice to actually see this implemented but i do have to say that if i am right and samurai integrates this as a mainline feature and it winds up seeing a lot of use um you know, this could wind up being a big stressor for Monero in terms of seeing how far it can actually scale under wide use. Yeah. End of the day, though, net good thing that somebody's actually building this out so that people who want to switch between these assets can actually do so, given that <laughs> I, I can't even think of an exchange off the top of my head that still has Monero listed because they all freaked out. Privacy coin, delist. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of things getting listed, the old uh, Coinbase Pro is going to list Tether pairs, as in USDT, on ERC20 Ethereum. Uh, evidently, last Thursday, they started taking Tether deposits, and tomorrow sometime, they are going to go live with limit orders, I believe, for BTC, ETH, uh, Euro, Pound, and USD, and then USDC pairs for Tether. Uh, very interesting that, uh, you know, Tether settles with the guys in New York and gives them a couple million bucks. And what do you know? A couple months later, all of a sudden they're on Coinbase. Pretty good. Yep. That is exactly what I was going to say. Like the instant I saw this, I just started laughing my ass off. Because if Coinbase is is going to gonna list something like this... um. That's pretty much the strongest signal you can get that um, the general worry of the government fucking with something does not exist right now. Um, and the timing after the settlement is just so hilarious. Yeah, Tether, not just for Chinese folks anymore. And it also just makes me wonder like, what their current attitude is about the partnership with Circle for the USDC. Because, like, them caving and adding Tether support, given their involvement there and the whole plan was, well, things like Tether just aren't fucking reliable. We need a professional stable coin. And that Tether settles. They <laughs> fucking list Tether. Yeah, a week ago, I wouldn't have known where to get Tether. But evidently tomorrow, I got a hookup. Based and Tethered. <laughs> All right, one more on the acceptance note. Uh, we work yet another no profit showing unicorn has said that they will accept Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDC, and Paxos, and several other digital currencies uh, as payment for their services through BitPay. Uh, so these guys are probably hurting about as bad as any um, commercial real estate vendor right about now has said that they're going to hold this on their balance sheet. Uh, interestingly enough, they're accepting it through BitPay, which is not quite the, we're going to hold it on our balance sheet kind of signaling, but Coinbase, who evidently does some running from WeWork, is going to start paying them via cryptocurrencies. So, uh, the good old Coinbase WeWork BitPay conglomerate is uh, is now at work and making headlines. So not the biggest fan of him, but it would be the funniest shit on earth if Michael Saylor just made like a parody version of his own like why you should put Bitcoin on your balance sheet videos and shit, except it's, it's just the business plan. For a unicorn, do you not have a workable business model? Do you not have any kind of sustainable income stream? You can buy Bitcoin. I, I, I imagine those with Ethereum or chess are overjoyed. I, I have no idea. But yes, I, I also support that branding. Get out there, unicorns, especially those of you that have yet to turn a profit. It'll just be amazing to see 
those com like please universe god whatever is out there just give me the synchronicity and the timing so all of those kinds of companies wind up being the ones who put it on their balance sheet right at the top just please god give me that and i will do whatever you want of me well that's the thing about accepting it as payment if you ever accept it then you're not really in control of when it hits the balance sheet but that's how FOMO works, right? Uh, and that's why 90% of traders lose money is, uh, you know, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. Finally, you decide to follow the herd. And that's the day the herd is headed over to the slaughterhouse, typically. You, like, I just saw a tweet floating around earlier from our Dogecoin. Um, some brilliant day trader decided at 40 cents um it would be a good idea to take 90 percent of the joint savings account he had with his wife and put it all into dogecoin and then what what, what happened right after that oh the alts are getting stupid i'm sorry this is when bitcoin slaps its dick on the table and crashes everything and you're wrecked well, it's probably better than having put it all up your nose. So you got that. And you're still over 50% on that trade guy. You know, Doja's worth a quarter, as I see here. So uh, good work. You're only down a little north of 50%. I'm sure your wife won't kill you, kill you. Just try. Hope you like sleeping on the couch. Alrighty. So are we ready for some fun research from ARK Invest and Square? Fire away, big guns. So they have both uh, collaboratively released a, um, a white pepe um, <laughs> on Bitcoin mining and clean energy. And I do believe on page four or five um, they actually have a link to the entire model that this paper is based on um, on github but pr pretty much it, it's just an analysis on bitcoin mining as kind of a buyer of last resort for energy and just how this can actually systematically um, built out correctly be used to finance and make viable um, sustainable energy production that currently isn't for kind of tertiary reasons um for instance kind of one of the examples they go into here is there is over um 200 gigawatts of delayed solar and wind um capacity potential they have um you know capital they can raise to fund this they these are sustainable things that will produce x amount of energy but two major problems are kind of holding this back um one is the the kind of duck curve issue where the kind of highest points of demand for electricity do not match up with these types of sources um highest production time of energy and so there's kind of that offset of most of this is produced say around noon with solar panels but most people want their energy you know after work like six or seven and so the the whole paper kind of lays out a setup where with just enough battery um pack setup you you could also have miners on standby and kind of have this rotational system um, where depending on what was most profitable at the time, you could flip miners on and use electricity to mine. Um, you could sell off power directly if that's possible or if it's necessary to um, kind of bridge that duck curve um, gap, you could dump it into battery pack storage um, to sell again later a few hours when people get off work and want electricity and kind of just balance these options here to always do the most profitable thing in the moment. 
And kind of one of the key points here is the fact that when you when you look at the ability to generate power, um, you need to be able to consume that. And a lot of these potential um, generation sites that could be built, they don't have grid connectivity um, built out that would actually enable them to push that electricity to the grid. That type of stuff requires massive studies and research by you know utility operators before you can actually do that. So that it's you you can't profitably build that power production until everything on the utility side, the research, the studies, the investment to build out grid connectivity is done. But you introduce Bitcoin mining, I can go build that giant field of solar panels right now, make it profitable and make money off of it right now. And I can just sit there and wait for those utilities to finish those studies to build out that connectivity and then start selling it to the grid if that makes more profitability or more if, if that's more profitable. And so just kind of slapping mining into this, um, you know, you make a whole lot of energy production development profitable now where it would require a lot more time and waiting and other things to be built out to be profitable. And this can actually snowball to the point that it's it's actually dragging down the cost of the energy production itself based on the profitability of the mining. And so the, the whole paper here is just kind of laying out how this type of a business model of thinking could actually really expand um, so-called green renewable energy um, available and bring up the the amount of the the base load electricity it's providing to the grid and now i do think all of this is completely accurate and i love seeing official research along these lines because this is shit people in this space have been talking about for close to a decade but the one thing i do kind of want to point out at the end here is why is there this kind of implicit assumption in this paper that this only applies to renewable energy? Like this same type of thinking is definitively happening in the oil and gas industry right now. Like all, all of these companies building mobile mining rigs that you can just drop on gas wells instead of flaring. So yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to see this type of model formalized and looked at like this, but I think there's kind of a, a lack of foresight here in thinking about this more generally. Like this is not just a thing for so-called green energy sources. This will happen with all energy sources. Yeah, uh, I remember Trace Mayer talking about this a year or two ago. And I, I think some of it is when when a plant is fully spun up but doesn't have a taker for its energy it's got to spin down or else sink that energy somewhere and essentially have it be worthless so he was talking about going around uh to various companies that know that they get into this state and negotiating zero or negative energy cost contracts to sink that energy when it needs to be sunk. And then on the flip side, you give the power company the right to take you offline when the majority of people want to run peak power for their air conditioners or their washing machines or whatever people are doing after they get home from work. So definitely this concept has been around. It's fun to see this extended a little bit into renewables and just how that works in terms of cost curves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think like this is a massive net gain for society at large if this plays out and not just in the, the sense of like green energy, like just energy period. Like this simultaneously is a way to help with load balancing on the grid, but also just a way to literally finance, um, at like building more energy production where it otherwise wouldn't be viable. I mean, like th this is, 
Like this is one of the most fundamental ways Bitcoin's incentives are just going to shove their nose up your ass and go, hi. Yeah, this pushes marginal energy production. And the best thing about that, whether it's using that flare gas or having a, a solar array come online that's substantially less powerful than the local uh, coal power plant, is simply that it takes that much longer for you to need another coal power plant or another natural gas fired plant. Mm -hmm. We have officially entered the major leagues. Loving it. Going to have to get our batting average up. All right. So are we ready for a weird story from Turkey? Turkish folks, it's your last week to buy stuff with Bitcoin. Make it happen. So um, the CEO of a Turkish crypto exchange, Thodex, um, has fleed the country. And, um, you know, the, this article on Bitcoin magazine looks like he, some of the quotes from him are just completely broken English. But, um, yeah, th this exchange, only 1.7% of its volume is Bitcoin. Um, Dogecoin was 52% of its total trading volume. And this exchange um, did a weird um, campaign just giving away free Dogecoin to new signups. And apparently a lot of people have complained they never got this. But um, in, in between kind of the weird phrasing um, in English here, um, it, it looks pretty much like a hacking incident occurred with this exchange years ago. And they finally got caught up in insolvency. So the CEO fled the country. And his statements to Bitcoin Magazine are pretty much, um, he, he left because he either would have killed himself or gone to jail. But he is now dedicated to repaying all the customers whose withdrawals they can't honor. And only after doing that will he return to his country to face justice. I see. Does uh is he aware that um that he you know he could have also left Turkey and not taken people's money with him? Probably just in his pocket. Didn't even know it was there. <laughs> like I'm I'm sorry I missed the part. Like sure he's he's either going to kill himself or be arrested, and he thinks that by taking people's money with him that he will solve the second part <laughs> i mean it's just to me it looks this simple they got hacked years ago probably never said anything and now finally got caught up in the fact that they're insolvent and so he ran away <laughs> that or just outright exit scam yes the the moral of the story is when you buy something on an exchange unless it is some absurdly tiny amount of money that is uneconomical to take custody of yourself. Um, after you buy it, you should probably withdraw it and take custody of it so that when things like this happen, you don't lose your money. Wise words. Don't be scared. You got to figure it out sometime. Today's probably the day if you haven't yet. It's the first real plunge into Bitcoin. Alrighty, Janine. So, why is Signal back in the news? Uh, well, um, I mean, a couple episodes ago we talked about uh, mobile coin, and um, you know, that was not fun. But uh, this is actually good news this time. Uh, I'm basically just going to read from Ars Technica's. Dan Gooden because he summarizes everything that happened here very well. So on Wednesday, Marlon Spike published a post about uh, vulnerabilities in Celebrate software that allowed him to execute malicious code on the Windows computer used to analyze devices. And side note for anyone who doesn't know, Celebrate is uh, one of these companies like Hacking Team that sells offensive surveillance and intrusion software 
to governments and also sometimes to corporations. Uh, you may have heard of Celebrite in relation to the Apple versus FBI case where the FBI was trying to force Apple to basically break their own security in order to open the phone uh, taken from one of the San Bernardino attackers. Um, and I believe it has recently been confirmed that uh, like how that was done, I haven't gotten to that story yet but i don't think it was a celebrate device it was suspected that it was suspected to be celebrate for a while they're an israeli company who are very popular um including um in the u.s government and so anyway uh moxie uh and a software engineer um not not clear they didn't really name names here but they exploited the vulnerabilities by loading uh specifically formatted files that can be embedded into any app installed on the device and then there's a quote from moxie's uh report where he says for example by including a specially formatted but otherwise innocuous file in an app on a device that is then scanned by celebrite it's possible to execute code that modifies not just the celebrite report being created in that scan but also all previous and future generated celebrate reports from all previously scanned devices and all future scanned devices in an arbitrary way inserting or removing text email photos contacts files or any other data with no detectable timestamp changes or checksum failures this could even be done at random and would seriously call the the data integrity of celebrate's reports into question and then Dan continues, Marlon Spike said he also found two Microsoft installer packages that are digitally signed by Apple and appear to have been extracted from the Windows installer for iTunes. Marlon Spike questioned if the inclusion uh, constitutes a violation of Apple copyrights. Apple did not immediately provide a comment when asked about this. In an email, a Celebrate representative wrote, Celebrate is committed to protecting the integrity of our customers' data, and we continually audit and update our software in order to equip our customers with the best digital intelligence solutions available. The representative didn't say if company engineers were aware of the vulnerabilities Marlin Spike uh, detailed or if the company had permission to bundle Apple software. Marlon Spike said he obtained the Celebrite gear in a truly unbelievable coincidence as he was walking and saw a small package fall off a truck ahead of me. The incident does seem truly unbelievable. Marlon Spike declined to provide additional details about precisely how he came into possession of the Celebrite tools. The vulnerabilities could provide fodder for defense attorneys to challenge the integrity of forensic reports generated using the Celebrate software. Celebrate representatives didn't respond to an email asking if they were aware of the vulnerabilities or had plans to fix them. Uh, and, and very long quote. Now, see, isn't this, this is great stuff, isn't this the moxie that we want to know and love? Um, imagine the good he could do if he wasn't distracting himself uh, with bullshit like MobileCoin. Also related to that, um, I can't imagine that U.S. law enforcement are going to be very happy about this and him uh, <laughs> right now, uh, given that they are Celebrate customers. Um, how does that bode for the uh, regulatory approval of MobileCoin? I don't know, and I don't care, but this is, uh, this, this is a very interesting takedown. It, it sounds like essentially he got a full own on whatever that analysis system is, which is great to document and have out there in public because this is the way people get prosecuted, as you mentioned. Uh, I thought one of the fun notes in there was one of the ways they attacked it was through a 2012 FFmpeg binary that was on there probably to run and analyze uh, video and audio material on those systems. but. As that uh, report noted, it has had numerous security patches since being compiled in 2012. And that's one way you can take over the operating system. It's great. Yeah. So we're going to find out <clears throat> how YouTube reacts to this. But like, how long is it going to take intelligent people to realize that you probably shouldn't trust Israeli security firms? Hey, don't be racist. Absolutely nothing to do with race. <clears throat> All politics. These guys are good at what they do. Unless they're not. Yep. So I guess uh, last up, uh, anniversary time. 
Yeah, so uh, in the growing tradition of Black Digest episodes falling on anniversary dates, um, today, the day that we're recording, is the 10-year anniversary of the publication of the Guantanamo Bay detainee files by WikiLeaks in April uh, 2011. And if you have not heard of those documents before, a summary from the release page. Most of these documents reveal accounts of incompetence familiar to those who have studied Guantanamo closely, with innocent men detained by mistake or because the U.S. was offering substantial bounties to its allies for al-Qaeda and Taliban suspects, and numerous insignificant Taliban conscripts from Afghanistan and Pakistan. Beyond those previously unknown cases, the documents also reveal stories of the 399 other prisoners released from September 2004 to the present day and of the seven men who have died at the prison. The memos are signed by the commander of Guantanamo at the time and describe whether the prisoners in question are regarded as low, medium, or high risk, although they were obviously not conclusive in and of themselves, as final decisions about the deposition of prisoners uh, were taken at a higher level. They represent not only the opinions of JTF Gitmo, but also the criminal investigation task force created by the Department of Defense to conduct interrogations in the War on Terror and the behavioral science teams consisting of psychologists who had a major say in exploitation of prisoners in interrogation. And uh, yeah, these documents remain significant to this day, not only because the extradition request and criminal charges for Julian Assange could get him sentenced uh, to up to 40 years in prison just for publishing this set of documents alone, but because this week there was a New York Times article that should really make everyone's blood uh, boil. It was titled, Court Rules Guantanamo Detainees Are Not Entitled to Due Process. The decision in the case of a Yemeni held at the military prison in Cuba since 2004 found that the indefinite detainees only constitutional right is to challenge his detention. The 3-0 decision issued on Friday by Judge Naomi Rao at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit upheld the indefinite detention of Abdul Salam al-Hela, 52, who argued for release by saying that the evidence against him relied on anonymous hearsay and that he never joined or supported al-Qaeda or any other terrorist group. Uh, the due process clause may not be invoked by alien without property or presence in the sovereign territory of the United States, Judge Rao wrote, a position also taken by Judge A. Raymond Randolph. In 2008, the Supreme Court decided uh, in another case v. Bush that Guantanamo detainees can challenge the lawfulness of their detention in federal court by filing writs of habeas corpus. The, the Supreme Court has not taken on Guantanamo case since, and in the intervening years, the lower courts have evaluated the detention of detainees individually. Mr. Fissel, a law professor at the Hofstra Law School who has worked on Guantanamo's detainee appeals at the war court, said the decision harks back to the era before habeas corpus, when the Bush administration sought to carve out this weird island, or weird zone, as a legal terra incognita, essentially a constitutional no-go zone. What the fuck? Assholes. Burn it all down. Um, speaking of Bush... There is a, uh, one more thing, great article in New York Magazine this week as well, titled George, H., uh, George W. Bush Can't Paint His Way Out of Hell. <laughs> the chilling spectacle of watching a political class redeem a criminal again. And there's a paragraph where the author, uh, Sarah Jones, writes, Someone might interject here and in true Sorkin-esque form say the presidency requires difficult decisions from its occupants. The presidency can induce a moral recklessness in people who consider themselves politically wise. In the eyes of some, the office is so meaningful that it mandates the absolution of all who occupy it. Maybe these people really are wise, in the same way that Bush is really a compassionate conservative. To be astute politically requires no great ethical commitments of a person. Impunity is the foundational value of Capitol Hill. Liberals believe it's a tit-for-tat relationship. I'll forgive your guy if you forgive mine. But as is generally the case, they are outclassed by their opposition. Bipartisanship is asymmetric. The right will recall everything it despised about Barack Obama until the sun dies. Liberals believe so strongly in the political institutions that empowered Bush and Trump, they can do nothing but move on, will forgive those same institutions of anything, will destroy themselves in their inability to admit the truth. Mm -hmm. So evidently you can be a black side without being a black side. Congrats. See, 
And the fucked thing is that prior to, I think, the late 1800s when our immigration policy shifted, um, it, it had been standing precedent that non-citizens have First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and Fifth Amendment rights under the Constitution and have Fifth and Sixth Amendment procedural rights if charged with a crime. So <clears throat> prior to the little <clears throat> oopsies escape hatch there, um, it was very explicitly established that it doesn't matter whether you are a citizen of this country or not, you have those rights if you are here. Like those are not reserved to just citizens. Yeah, I believe the word is non-justiciable. As in, literally, you have been put into a box where it is not possible to bring any kind of justice process to your case. This is actually a term that has been used against also American citizens, by the way. Like, this is not only relevant, like, anyone who thinks, oh, well, I'm not a Guantanamo detainee, or I'm not a person of interest, blah, blah, blah. No, this can apply across the board. <laughs> Like, if you think this is just going to stay with terrorism-related cases, oh boy. Also, being a U.S. citizen also doesn't protect you, because this shit has literally been used against a U.S. citizen who has been accused of similar associations. And he was told, literally, he cannot be told why he is on a kill list under Obama. He could not be told why he had been put on a kill list. He's an American citizen. Yep. This is just one of those ways that they completely stuff around the Constitution. <clears throat> and until they uh, repeal or let the Patriot Act expire, um, yeah, they just have to say that magic word terrorist and you get thrown in that same bucket. The Patriot Act to this day remains literally one of the most unpatriotic <laughs> laws to ever be instituted. Yep. <sighs> well, unless you guys have any more on this one, shall we call it final thoughts? I believe you have a giant final thought, right? Well, actually, I have <clears throat> kind of a more serious one uh, first. Uh, yeah, so Dan Kaminsky died the other day. And that fucking sucks. <laughs> like, he, he was not only fucking brilliant, but I cannot think of a single other person with that kind of attention and stature who would just spend so much time engaging with random people like me on the internet and spend his time doing that in complete good faith. Like, you know, the world lost... A fucking brilliant good dude. Also, for history's sake, worth reminding people that he was the one who put the uh, ASCII Bernanke. Did he also put ASCII Bern? No, he he put the one of Len Sassman into the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. He he was one of the first competent people who showed up and said Bitcoin is broken and I'm gonna break it and failed. And then just, like, he didn't get pissy or butthurt. He went, okay, I couldn't break it. And then changed a lot of his mind on it. Yeah, and he, uh, I mean, as far as I'm aware, you know, it's common in the infosec industry for people to hate Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So, obviously, myself and others are a minority there. Um... But, and I believe he was not, uh, I believe he was part of that in, in not be, in the, being the majority opinion, but I do appreciate the fact that when Assange got arrested, he was one of the very few people to uh, actually stand up to all of these other assholes in Osec who were laughing again about, oh, crazy guy being dragged out of an embassy. Isn't it so funny? Where's his cat? Um, he was one of the few people to actually say, whatever your position is on Julian Assange, the pointing and laughing I've seen this uh, seen since his apprehension has been inappropriate, embarrassing, and undignified. Um, so yeah, like I feel like 
I, I mean, I don't, I don't know him very well, and I don't know if that's the kind of graceful attitude that he took to everyone, but um, I appreciate the fact that he, I mean, as far as I know, that was not a popular stance for him to take, and so I feel like more people should engage in that uh, and, you know, remember the values that they espouse to hold and not shit on people because they find them personally unpleasant. Mm -hmm. All right, Fudd Janine, you guys got anything else? I'm thoughtless. All right. Well, well. wait, one more thing. Another thing he did, uh, he, unfortunately, uh, this JW saga also involved him, and he was kind of passively supporting him for a while, but he came around eventually, and <laughs> uh, I believe he had some uh, somewhat supportive things to say about Cold Card, or at least was surprised that it, uh, I believe he called it an ultra paranoid design or something like that. And uh, I don't know, a final thought I recommend everyone to look at. Um, to look at Rodolfo's tweet uh, about the Yeti cult setup ad, where apparently there was, I don't know, there's some kind of video of, I don't even know if it's real, but someone made a video of a woman wearing a Chewbacca mask, and the caption says, my wife lost a bet and had to wear this Chewbacca mask while giving birth. <laughs> and so Rodolfo said it was a Yeti cult setup ad. <laughs> now that's just cruel and unusual. Good guy. I I am pretty sh I the the thing that makes me think that it was probably set up is because I I mean I I don't know maybe there are actually Chewbacca masks where any noise you make is like transformed into a Chewbacca noise but like she's like heaving and moaning and stuff and it all sounds like <laughs> it all sounds like a Wookiee do <laughs> amazing <sighs> alrighty though I guess uh. We will wrap it up for today, and you are going to get a message that some of you need to hear at the end. Later, punks. Bye. Jeez. 9.9999% of the people that own Bitcoin are fucking morons. Retarded imbeciles. That's just it. <laughs> Wasn't there? That's